So if you are all up to speed, without further ado, why don't we dive in? I'm hoping that this being a Bible study, you've got a copy of the Bible in front of you, your Bible, the one that you use. It might be on your phone, your tablet or on paper. And we are studying Mark's Gospel. We've done three chapters, the first three chapters. This week we are going to be focusing on Mark's Gospel chapter four. So if you'd like to find that, Mark's Gospel chapter four. And as usual, what I'm going to do over the course of the next hour uh, is I'm going to sort of split it into chunks, quite sizable chunks on this particular occasion. I'm going to read each chunk to you so that we've broken the word and we've shared in the word together. And then I'm going to explain it in some depth. All right. Uh, and this is about as deep as we're going to get uh, because we're taking a lot of time OK, over this Bible study, as you may have noticed, I mean, an hour is a lot longer than your average sermon in church on a Sunday morning. All right. But the advantage of being able to do it like this, me sitting here at home, you sitting there at home, is that we can really focus in on what the passage means. And you can go back and review bits of it on the recording in case you'd forgotten what I said or you got mixed up or something or you just got bored, <laughs> decided to go out and do some shopping in the middle. If you do, it's entirely up to you. I mean, I wouldn't like it if you tried that in church on a Sunday morning is what I'm saying. All right. But uh, here you can do what you like, can't you? Whoa. Right. Mark's Gospel, Chapter four. I'm reading, of course, from the New International Version. Again, Jesus began to teach by the lake. The crowd that gathered around him was so large that he got into a boat and sat in it out on the lake, while all the people were along the shore at the water's edge. He taught them many things by parables and in his teaching said, listen, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came out, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns which grew up and choked the plants so that they did not bear grain. Still other seed fell on good soil. It, gr it came up, grew and produced a crop, some multiplying 30, some 60, some a hundred times. Then Jesus said, whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. When he was alone, the twelve and the others around him asked him about the parables. He told them, the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you. But to those on the outside, everything is said in parables so that they may be ever seeing, but never perceiving and ever hearing, but never understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. Then Jesus said to them, don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? The farmer sows the word. Some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. Others like seed sown in rocky places, hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Still others, like seed sown among thorns, hear the word. But the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth and the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Others, like seed sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it and produce a crop, some 30, some 60, some 100 times what was sown. OK, so there you are. And uh, unless you've been living in a cave all your life, I bet you've heard this parable before. It's the parable of the sower. We all know it. If you've ever been to a harvest festival in any church ever, chances are you've had this read at least one of those harvest services it is an absolute shoe in for a harvest festival isn't it yeah but it's not a story about agriculture let's get that straight right away in fact really this is the first of jesus's parables yeah chapter four is all about parables jesus's parables he hinted at it last week in chapter three uh talking um to uh, people in parable to talking to the the pharisees in a parable about satan casting out demons and the power of satan and all that sort of stuff check last week's for details but now he really gets into 
parables. What is a parable? A parable is a bit like a metaphor or to be more accurate, a simile. We use the word metaphor a lot these days, but sometimes we use it wrongly. If you compare something to something else, that's actually a simile. Yeah. If you don't compare it, but you just say that something is something, then that's a metaphor and you've got to figure out what it is that it applies to. And you might think, well, why does Jesus make use of so much metaphor or simile? Why does he say the kingdom of heaven is like this? It's like a farmer sowing his seed. Uh, it appears to be a little bit evasive in some ways. Isn't Jesus making it a little bit more complicated? What's going on? Jesus talked in parables all the time. This is the first big one. A story that he made up potentially on the spot without even thinking about. It. There are some people who say, well, there he was by the lake sitting in his boat. And he's done this before, hasn't he? Do you remember in, in the last chapter last week, the crowd is so immense and pressing him in on every side. And they haven't got security. There are the 12 disciples. They're doing their best. But the best thing for Jesus to do is get into a boat. Some of the disciples were uh, fishermen, so it's probably one of their boats push it off a bit into the lake, drop the anchor in the shallow water. Jesus sits there. And again, as we said last week, Jesus knows everything. Jesus has created physics, chemistry, biology and all the rest of it. So he understands how all of the laws of nature work. He knows if he sits on a boat with flat water around him, the sound of his voice will carry super effectively and that people will hear it better than if he stood on the dry land with everybody all around him okay so there he is sitting in his boat and he's teaching them and he can do it at his leisure he can relax a bit and people are all along the shoreline and they are you know sort of stretching back from the edge of the water and they're all listening intently to what he's got to say and he speaks always in parables in metaphors in similes. Anybody who's ever heard me do my preaching on a Sunday morning knows that I'm a, I'm a big fan of the metaphor as well. I use it all the time and uh, I tell a lot of stories in my preaching and the stories are always to illustrate important kingdom truths, truths about God, about Jesus. The problem is if you try telling people straight off exactly what Jesus is, who, who Jesus is, what it means to be loved by God, how to live a Christian life, what eternity is like, what's heaven like and all the rest of it. You rapidly start either running out of words that fit because you're talking about things that are super normal or people stop to understand, stop understanding what you're saying. It's like, what are you on about? It becomes too difficult. I've got a degree in theology uh, and admittedly it was a good 25 years ago that I did it. But I remember sitting in some of the lectures at Nottingham University studying theology and some of the, the clever brainy brainy things that some of these professors of theology and whatever were, were coming out with. I, they, they just did go right over my head and I had to go home and I had to study my notes that I'd made and study the books that they wanted me to read to try and get a handle on what they were talking about. It's tough stuff. Now, Again, if you know me, I'm not into making it hard for you. I want to make it as easy as possible to understand this stuff. And the fact is we are meant to understand it. It's not meant to be a mystery. It's not meant to be something. Jesus' teachings, I mean, are not meant to be things that are only understood by professors and brainy people. If you are a brainy person, there is an enormous amount of depth in every one of Jesus' teaching. And you can pursue it and you can understand it and you can consider it and uh, theologize and theorize on it to your heart's content and it will take you all your life to do it and there will still be more but for those of us more normal mortals Jesus really does want us to understand something reasonably basic some great important truth he wants to put it across to us and so the best way that he has often is to do it via the medium of metaphor or as I say more exactly simile comparing something to something else because it sticks in our head a lot easier some people say that Jesus is sat there in his boat and he may have even seen a farmer on the hills around the lake 
actually sowing seed as and thought there's a good one I'll use that because that's how Jesus knows this stuff he hasn't gone away and rehearsed it he hasn't gone away and studied it he's just freestyling it he's the son of God he has that anointing he knows everything sometimes it sounds like I know like I sit here freestyling it to you guys because I don't appear to be any using any notes I'm not using any notes but that doesn't mean I've just switched Facebook on and I'm just chancing it winging it okay what it means is that I've spent quite a lot of time researching this and looking into it and reading different bits and pieces and putting together something that I hope makes sense and that's the way that Jesus did it as well except unlike me having to do a lot of background work in order to present this bible study Jesus could just do it on the fly yeah he used metaver so it would stick in our minds there is a crowd they're all listening no, none of them are taking notes none of them are writing this down they're just listening and he wants it to stick in their brains some of Jesus's uh, parables as you will see as we go through the gospel some of the detail in him is quite ridiculous fantastical detail okay and he did that on purpose as well so that people would go what is he on about but they would remember it okay so that's why you use metaphor. If you're still in doubt, uh, can I, I give you an example of, uh, of, of a simile uh, by the great Jeremy Clarkson. OK, you might not be a fan of Jeremy Clarkson, but he is the master of the metaphor. And he was trying to describe uh, the sound made by a high performance Mercedes sports car. As you know, high performance sports cars are particularly noisy when they whiz off up the street. Yeah. And he said the sound of this car is a bit like Barry White eating wasps. <laughs> now, I love that because it's quite funny, the idea of considering Barry White, the, the, the big soul singer, eating wasps. I mean, and the sound that that would produce, that, that amuses me a lot. It, but it makes me remember it, you know. And it also, because I have no idea of what a high performance Mercedes sports car sounds like, unless I actually hear one. So the idea that it might sound something like Barry White chewing wasps gives me a sort of an idea that it's a fairly angry noise. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Uh, so brilliant. That is what Jesus is after, the power of the metaphor to make us remember things. The next thing that he's after as well is that he wants us to think about what he's saying. So if he just tells us directly what the kingdom of God is like, then we, we won't necessarily think about it. We could just reel it off and say, oh, well, Jesus said it's this, but we won't understand it. We'll just reel off what Jesus said. So Jesus deliberately tells a story about the big God truth that he is sharing with us so that we think about the story and then think, now, what does he actually mean? And then we, we get closer to discovering it and owning the truth of it for myself oh hi sandy who's just made a comment i know where we are in mark but where please it's chapter four sandy and i've just read the first uh, umpteen verses 20 verses which is the parable of the sower and it's gone a bit dark outside so i'm going to turn my light on a minute that's better oh i might have gone a bit glowy on the screen now but uh, there you go uh, so, uh, yeah, at least I could read my Bible now. It was going a bit dark outside, as it does in January. Hey ho, it's the winter. So there we go. So num number one thing, Jesus uses, no problem, Sandy. <laughs> Jesus uses me uh, metaphor because it helps us to remember what he's talking about. He uses metaphor as well because it helps us to not just hear what he says and then repeat it, but to think about it and understand so if we've, we've there's a thought process we've got Jesus you imagine you're standing there on the edge of the lake Jesus talking about a farmer sowing seed and you're thinking what is he on about this must mean something especially at the end when in verse 9 Jesus finishes this story about a, a man sowing seed and he says whoever has ears let him hear okay which means have you understood this everybody yeah have, have you listened to this do you understand what I'm saying think about it is something that Jesus is saying, not in an angry way. He's just saying, right, you've heard the story. Think about what it might mean. OK, think about it, interpret it, understand it, be enlightened by it. Use your brain and you don't need a lot of brain to uh, figure out what I'm talking about. OK, there we go. There is a third reason why Jesus talks in parables. We're going to come to it in just a moment. 
because uh, we've read up to the end of verse 9. Now that is what the big crowd hears whilst he's in the boat. Later on, when the teaching is over, when the boat has been rowed back to the bank and the crowd have gone away, the 12, as it says, that means the 12 disciples. Remember last week we were in chapter 3 and Jesus went up a mountain, spent all night there praying about who his 12 closest friends were going to be. God the Father tells him by name who they are. So he comes down, he says, you, 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 you. A bit like picking a football team. Yeah, he, pick, he picks the ones who, that God has chosen for him. And they are hanging around all the time now. And they are referred to by Mark as the 12. But notice it's not just the 12 disciples. There are others around him. So he's got lots of other friends as well who hang out with him all the time. The crowds come and go. The crowds come out to hear him, they hear his teaching, they might see him do a miracle, they might see him perform some healings, they might not do. They wouldn't have done that day, would they? Because he was out there in a boat, he was just sitting there teaching. No healings today, everybody. Some of them would have gone home saying, oh, I came for a healing, but no, well, never mind. I've got that thing about that farmer to think about. I'll, I'll give that some thought. Thought, what, what does he mean? Uh, I'll, I'll talk about it. Maybe talk with my family or, or Fred, who was there with me, and see what he thinks it was about, you know? So it's got him thinking. But now they are alone and he's with the 12 disciples, but there are others as well. These are the people who don't go home at the end of the day. These are the people who don't go home for their dinner at the end of the teaching. These are the people who stick around with Jesus and they will go and eat with Jesus wherever he's going to eat. If he's going to eat, they will hang out with him and they will talk. And I imagine this a scenario a bit like if you're out camping, you know, like when you're out camping in the summer. And uh, if you were there and you're with other people, this may be within the uh, context of the scouting organisation or something like that. But where you've got multiple tents and f a few of you have gathered and there it is, it's dark, you've lit a little fire. All right. You've lit a little fire and you're sitting there, I don't know, eating some sausages and drinking a few beers, something like that. Yeah. And you talk. And there's something about sitting around a fire and talking with people that, you know, you can trust. Yeah which brings out all sorts of wonderful truths, doesn't it? It's great. The campfire experience of sharing. It's wonderful. And this is what is going on from verse 10 onwards. I'm not saying there's an actual campfire. I'm not saying that they're outside, but they might be. They're sitting there and they're just reflecting on the day. And it becomes very apparent that this group of 12 fairly unimpressive disciples, not great intellectual theological characters they're fishermen remember they're tax he was probably the brightest of the lot matthew the tax collector at least he was numerate and literate and stuff like that but a lot of them are as thick as anything yeah they were proper normal people not educated at all and they don't understand what he's on about so here's jesus trying to use metaphor so that we remember it trying to use metaphor so that we go away and think about it think about the meaning rather than just go and they still don't get it and so they say uh, uh, can you can you explain jesus what what this is on about this parable business now let's get something straight parables were nothing new so if you were Jewish, if you belong to the nation of Israel, and most of these people were Jewish that were listening, OK, at this point, uh, watch out next week for people who weren't Jewish. They're going to pop up. Most of these people were Israelites. They were Jewish people. They were well versed in the uh, Old Testament law. And so they knew that parables were used a lot. And if they went to the synagogue and they were doing Bible study there, the teachers of the law would use parables, metaphors as well. OK, nothing new, nothing that Jesus started. So nobody could, could accuse him of doing something. Oh, we, don't, we can't relate to this. They could all relate to it. They all understood what was going on when Jesus spoke in parables. If you're in doubt about this, consider the Old Testament book called Proverbs. You have a read of Proverbs and you will see that loads of it is pure metaphor. It's like this is like this. This is like this. This is what this means. Let's compare this to this. All right. So uh, nothing new about it, but they didn't understand. They were normal people. They weren't brainy. They weren't on it, you know. So um, Jesus says, OK, I'll explain it to you. Right. And he goes on, as we'll see shortly, to explain to them, to the 12 disciples and to all the other people who hung out with him all of the time. He used to explain all the stuff to them. But if you were the, as it were, the crowd, the general public who came out to see him and then went away, all you would get was the actual parable itself 
and Jesus would say, do you get it? Listen to this. Whoever has ears, let him hear. Go away. Think about it. Understand it. Remember it. So here's Jesus sitting, as it, as it were, again, around the campfire with these people. And uh, they say, what are these parables? And Jesus says this thing in verse 11, which is important that we understand. The secret of the kingdom of God, he said, has been given to you. In other words, I'm explaining what the kingdom of God is all about. I'm explaining who God is. I'm explaining how he feels about you. I'm explaining about your salvation, your forgiveness and your faith. OK, um, it's been, this has all been given to you. You've got the information, but I want you to think about it. But to those on the outside, he says, everything is said in parables for a different reason. And then he goes on to quote, and in your Bible, I'm sure as it is in mine, it's in quotation marks. This means that Jesus is quoting something from the Old Testament. He's actually quoting from the book of Isaiah, where Isaiah prophesies that the word would go out, but not everybody would understand it. Their hearts would be hardened to it. They wouldn't be interested in hearing it. What it actually says, they may be ever seeing, but never perceiving. Uh, ever hearing but never understanding if they were otherwise they might turn and be forgiven and there's an air of sort of what's it called it's kind of like you know sarcasm almost saying you know they're not going to do it if they did well who knows they might even turn and be forgiven but they're not going to be because they'll look at all this but they won't get it they'll hear it but they won't understand it and this is like the third reason that Jesus speaks in parables okay important that we understand this he wants us he wants the crowd to understand exactly what he's talking about but there are people in the crowd the pharisees yeah who are opposing him and when they are listening to everything that jesus says they don't want to understand it not at all all they want is for jesus to say something about god that they consider to be blasphemous so if Jesus says, this is the kingdom of God, God says this, God does this, they'll go, oh, how dare he speak about God? No one knows about God. They're just looking in everything that he says for some reason to accuse him. That is why, says Jesus, I just talk in parables, because there are some people who are just listening out, not for what I'm trying to say, not for the truth of what I'm trying to say, but they're listening for anything that they could take offence at. Do you ever encounter this? If you're a preacher in particular, I bet you do. Sometimes you deliver your best efforts uh, if you're preaching in church. And then after the service, people will come out, out up to you and say, I was very offended by what you said. And you go, really? Because you don't want to offend anybody. And say, what was it that offended you? And they will tell you something that they think you said. And you may not have even said it. This happened to me uh, maybe a year or so ago. And I preached a sermon and somebody came up to me afterwards and said uh, some, something that you said in that sermon was was very offensive to somebody. Uh, and they told me about it. And I said, well, what was it? And they told me what this person said I had said. And I said, but I didn't say that at all. And the person who was relating it said, well, that's what they heard. Sometimes you can say one thing, but there might be somebody who hears it. And they hear something completely different and they take offence at it. You could argue that they have set out to take offence at it before you even said it. They will take what you have said and they will twist it and make it mean the opposite and they will find something offensive in it. That's why some people say it's best to keep your head down. <laughs> yeah, best to keep your head down. Don't stick your head above the parapet. Don't come out and have an opinion, some people say, on anything in life because you might offend somebody. And the last thing we want is to offend people. Jesus used to offend people all the time, sometimes deliberately, because he wanted to shake them up. But he always told the truth. OK, so. Jesus speaks in parables, so it doesn't give the haters, as they call them now, any ammunition at all. And if you've got the mindset that you think you know what Christianity is and you don't want anything to do with it, then you can listen to the best preachers in the world and you won't get it because your mind is closed. Ever seeing, never perceiving, ever hearing, never understanding. 
It's a sad thing, isn't it? But Jesus knows it to be true. So Jesus says to them in verse uh, 13, what you don't even understand this parable though. I mean, that I do want you to understand the truths of the parable. I bet loads of people did who were sat listening to that on the lakeside. Well, how come you, you don't? He says, if you can't understand this one, this one's really easy. He says, how are you gonna go on with the ones that are a bit more technical, that speak of deeper, more abstract, more sort of, you, you can't find things to relate to it on earth. You know, difficult, like what heaven is like. It's probably the ultimate one. It's the hardest one of all. What is heaven like? And in the gospels, Jesus describes what heaven is like in different, multiple different ways. It's really hard to get a handle on something, a place that we've never been, that we've never experienced, and we can never go until the day that we leave this life. Really hard to describe. Anyway, Jesus then goes on to explain what it's all about. What the parable of the sower is all about, just in case you don't know, in case its meaning has eluded you all these years. The parable of the sower is about your faith. That's the seed. Your faith. Your faith in God. Your faith that there is something more to life than just what we can see, the physical in our environment, that there is more that there is a spiritual aspect to our life and that everything we see and everything that we smell and touch and feel, it's not an accident. You're not an accident either. It's all been made. It's all been created. Why? That's what we want to figure out. If there's a God and he has made everything, what is his purpose? And what is my role? What is your role as part of God's purpose? What is your place? in the universe only jesus can tell you and he's trying to tell you here and he's talking about your faith so the farmer sows the word says jesus but when it says word think of it as living word in greek logos okay and that's faith the farmer sows faith okay so some people are like seed along the path Right. And I mean, when Jesus was coming up with this parable, people would have been going, I know what he's talking about. I know what he's talking about because I've seen examples of this. People who like, you know, they don't have any root at all. And so they hear this thing about God. You know, God, God is real. God loves you. God exists. And they go, I don't think so. You know, it, it really doesn't last long. As soon as they hear it, there's a something, a little voice kicks in and says, ah, that's rubbish. I don't have anything to do with that. And the people, I know people and I, who aren't Christians and they're my friends and we will talk in great depth about all sorts of things. Yeah. But the minute I sort of happen to mention Jesus or my faith, they'll go, shut us down. You know, go, oh, no, I don't want to talk about that. They're a bit like the people the the seed of their faith is on the path and it doesn't get a chance to to sort of flourish in any way because the minute that it does they're gone they think no no i don't want that no way to do that jesus puts it much more strongly he says it's something external it's satan who comes along and nicks it off you they think oh no somebody else is hearing about jesus quick i'm going to just go up to them confuse them and go no you don't want to hear that mate and they go no i don't want to hear that i'm religious rubbish that's not me that's the first one okay others says jesus it's like your faith is sown in a rocky place you hear the word and you think, yeah, how fantastic to think that there is a God after all and that he loves me and he's got a purpose for me. Yeah, how brilliant. And you take it on board and you get really excited about it. Yeah, but you still don't have the roots. You can't you can't dig in. Do you know what I mean? Because you're in a rocky place. It's difficult for you. Your circumstances may be difficult. You might be coping with a lot of things. You might have a lot of questions. You might look at your life and say, but I've had so much hardship and things now are really tough that I hear that and I wish it was true, but so many bad things have happened or are happening to me now that I, I can't believe it these people you may be one of these people if you are all credit to you for being here we'd love to move you in the next few minutes from being in a rocky place to being in good soil and that can happen my friends because this is the word of god i know i'm explaining it but it can be changing your life right now i'm not i'm just telling you what it means okay so if you're in the rocky place the chances are that your faith's not going to last last long because it says when trouble or persecution comes you give up I met a young guy once 
and uh, uh, and he knew I was a Christian and um, and he said I used to be a Christian I says did you I says what happened he says my dad died and he says I, I kind of gave up at that point bang exactly what Jesus is talking about and I understand how it is and you may have struggled with this this very thing the death of a loved one and it's made you question your faith because your faith hasn't taken root properly yet and some of us give up at that point okay Conversely, I have known many adults who have come to church and come to faith as a result of one of their loved ones passing away. And it's made them, rather than put them off faith, it's put them onto it because they thought there must be more than this. There must be more than this. And I'm going to go to church and see if there is. And praise God, during my lifetime, I've seen quite a number of people who've come from that perspective to church they've encountered Jesus and they've given their life to him and he has helped them mourn the passing of their loved one and then go on to flourish and be and have their faith in full effect all right we'll get into that though in a minute right the third category of people in the parable of the sower is the seed sown among thorns now they hear the word but they've got so many worries they're anxious about things that they, they can't take it on board and trust it all right and Jesus talks about the deceitfulness of wealth and I've referred to this previously you might remember so if you are fairly well off affluent and Covid isn't threatening you economically and you're all right actually thank you and you've got a good pension laid up and you're living in a nice house and you've got a car and plenty of money in the bank blah 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 it's very easy for you and for me you know because I'm I'm fine thank you <laughs> you know materially it's very easy for us to say well, what do I need God for because I'm all right you know and that can work against you. Conversely, it can have the opposite effect. I know plenty of people and they're fairly materially comfortable, shall we say. And when you ask them about it, you say, it's, it's not down to me. God has blessed me. And some people he blesses mightily in a material sense as well as in a spiritual sense. Others of us are uh, poor as a church mouse, but we still say God has blessed me for any little thing that comes our way. I think that's a very healthy way to live your faith, to have faith and to say the way, because I'm a Christian, because I believe that there's a God who loves me, any little thing that happens to me that is good, that benefits me, I won't say, oh, aren't I great? Or wasn't that lucky? I will say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, even if it's a little thing finding me car keys, finding a parking place at Tesco, I will say, thank you, Jesus, for that. Whether it's right or not, I will ascribe it to him. That's part of what having faith is. Is this appealing to you? <laughs> I hope so. Yeah, people will think you're nuts. <laughs> what do you mean God found me that parking space? It was going to be there anyway. Yeah, but I believe that God is in control of my life and pretty much anything that happens for good comes from him. And anything that happens for bad, if I get ill or somebody else gets ill or, you know, I'm in debt or, I'm, you know, I'm troubled or I'm anxious, that doesn't come from God. That doesn't come from God because I live in a world where bad things can happen, where there is good and there is evil. And there has to be good and there has to be evil because if there wasn't, there would be no love. And it's the price we pay for love. It's, it's a big price, but it's worth having. OK. And some of the bad things that happen to you happen as a result of Satan whispering in your ear and saying, you don't need that. You don't need that faith. You don't need to be nice to people. When you listen to Jesus talking, uh, don't listen to what he's saying that might benefit you. Just look for opportunities to have a go at him. Look for opportunities to be offended. That's not from God, is it? And it's not really from you either, is it? Your human nature isn't like that, is it? Are you that cynical? Are you that bitter? If you are, my friends, can we move you from a thorny place where the, the deceitfulness of wealth and the desire for other things that get in the way get pushed out of the way so your faith is not choked? Can we move you right now into good soil? Realise where you're standing. Realise that standing amongst the weeds is tricky. The weeds of life, all the things you want, all the things you think you need, but you actually don't. All the things that society tells you you ought to have and you haven't got, don't even bother. Move from the, the place where the weeds are, the thorns are, the thorns that will hurt you. Move to the good soil. 
Others, said Jesus in verse 20, people seed sown on good soil. So you hear the word and the seed of faith is sown inside of you and you are out of a dangerous situation. <laughs> I do the same thing with my keys as Linda. Yeah, absolutely. I'm a bit wary of the car keys thing, though. You know, it's like uh, I was looking for my keys and I couldn't find them anywhere. So I said to Jesus, I said, can you tell me where my keys are, Jesus? And do you know they were in the last place I looked? Of course they were. <laughs> so I'm a little wary, but I will still attribute it to Jesus. If I've lost my keys and then found them again, I'll attribute that to Jesus. Yeah, because why not? I'll attribute everything to Jesus. It's the only way to work. Linda, you may re remember a sermon I preached many years ago where I was running out of uh, diesel in my car and I was desperate not to run out of diesel because it's a big deal, isn't it, if you run out of diesel. And I'm trying to get to the petrol station and all the way I was praying, come on, Jesus. Yes, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Just giving it him all the time just to get me to the petrol station. Yes, I did get to the petrol station and uh, I'll, I think it was down to him. It, it might not have been if I wasn't actually, you know, uh, praying about it, then I might have still made it. But hey, who cares? When you've got faith, you attribute good things to God. That's just how you roll. Do you know the effect of that? It makes you so much more content in your life, giving it to God. Yeah. Or giving him the things that trouble you and saying, I don't want this anymore. Lord, will you take it away from me? Yes, he will. And uh, notice what happens if, you, if you've got a seed of faith and you're growing in good soil, it means you can put down roots. And if you've put down roots in your faith, in your Christian faith, it doesn't matter if you've only been a Christian for a matter of days or even weeks. Yeah, you can still be putting down your roots from day one and nothing will shake you. And you can withstand all these storms of life. I'm starting to mix my metaphors now, but kind of Jesus did the same thing, as you will discover in future uh, Bible studies. And you produce a crop, it says. So faith grows inside of you, says Jesus. It's important that you understand this and it makes you better. It makes you stronger and you produce 30 times what you should do, what you ever could do if you weren't a Christian or 60 times or 100 times. In agricultural terms, if a farmer sowed his seed and as you can see, he scatters it fairly randomly, doesn't it? And he lands all over the place. Yeah. If it managed to produce a hundred times more than what he expected it to. That would be very unusual. And that would be very unusual for us with our faith, but it does happen. You can produce far more uh, in terms of your character and the things that you achieve in your life and the happiness that you experience in your life. You will achieve far more with Jesus than you ever could without him. Your faith, that seed of faith growing within you will produce far more than if you don't allow that seed of faith in at all, which is what the Pharisees were doing. They were listening to the parables, but they weren't thinking about them. They weren't considering they were blinded to it. The seed of faith was not in them and they were on their own. OK, their religion effectively was man made. So there you go. OK, and uh, yeah, now this is important. Some people say, well, what sort of a farmer is he? God. If he scatters the seed of faith around, but he scatters it in all these really duff places, why doesn't he just scatter it in the good soil so that we can all grow? We can all put down roots and none of us are in danger. The fact is, Jesus recognises that people are in different situations in life. And some of them are, some of us are quite susceptible to being led away. Yeah, we're quite naive, really. we're easily led. So, you know, people say things to us and psh, we're off, you know, others. We do. We do have things in life that are real challenges for us. And that makes it more difficult for our faith to take root. And others of us, we do have other distractions like material wealth, you know, worldly contentment or our other desires. Uh, more of that, actually, in my Sunday preaching, which is coming up. Uh, tune in this Sunday, if you want, on the Trinity Facebook page for our morning worship at 1045. And you will hear me start a whole new series of Bible studies that are going to lead up to the beginning of Holy Week. Uh, more of that on Sunday. All right. OK, cool. So but the fact is, you know, if you happen to be in a rocky place or choked by thorns or on the path when you first heard the word of God, fair enough, it's not going to take root. But that's not the only time that God sows his seed. The farmer sows his seed every year, doesn't he? Yeah. Every spring he sows seed. Periodically, regularly, lots of times God 
will sow the seed of faith in you at different stages of your life. There are not many people who as adults come to faith in Jesus through only one seed sowing exercise. Usually there are far more examples of little things happening in their life or people saying things to them or sometimes God speaking to them directly and they have to put all of these things. There are several harvests, there are several turns of year, there are several sowings before your seed of faith finds you in good soil and takes root. So don't give up. If you're struggling with it, if it hasn't quite, hasn't quite happened for you yet, stick with it, okay? God has got this. You'll not stop him loving you. Uh, he will keep sowing until your faith starts to take effect. He will not give up on you. He wants the harvest. He wants a harvest of everyone. No one is exempt from this. That's why Jesus said he just sows his seed everywhere because he's trying to catch everyone. The people who are in good soil and the people who aren't, he's trying to get everyone. He's prepared to waste a lot of seeds of faith in order to get the harvest. Let's continue. I'm going to read now from verse 21 of chapter 4. He, Jesus, he said to them, Do you bring in a lamp and put it under a bowl or a bed? Instead, don't you put it on a stand? For whatever is hidden is meant to be disclosed. Whatever is concealed is meant to be brought out into the open. If anyone has ears to hear, let them hear. Consider carefully what you hear, he continued. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you. And even more, whoever has will be given more. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. He also said, this is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground. Night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. All by itself, the soil produces grain. First the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it, because harvest has come. Again, he said, what shall we say the kingdom of God is like, or what parable shall we use to describe it? It is like the mustard seed, which is the smallest of all seeds on earth. Yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants, with such big branches that the birds can perch in its shade. With many similar parables, Jesus spoke the word to them as much as they could understand. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. But when he was alone with his disciples, he explained everything. You know, Mark's Gospel, it was written by a man, John Mark, but it is God inspired. The Holy Spirit has really ordered it, put it in the right order. I'm not even sure whether Mark intended it to be in this order, but we have been taken on a journey of faith as we started reading in chapter one. And now we're really getting into the big stuff, the life changing, the heartwarming, the joyous stuff. It's Jesus's teachings and explanations of how things work. So he still talk. Uh, well, is he? No, 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 no. Well, it's difficult for me to figure out at this point, verse 21, whether Jesus is still talking, as it were, around the campfire to his 12 disciples and his other close friends, or whether he's now back at the lakeside talking to the bigger crowd. He certainly is later on. All right. So for this little bit, this lamp on a stand bit, I'm going to presume, perhaps rightly, perhaps wrongly, that he's still talking to the, the smaller group. He's still explaining things to them. All right. Because it kind of implies in the text that he goes straight on from what he's just said. Interesting. Do you bring a lamp in uh, to put it under a bowl? And I'm thinking, well, if it was dark and they were sat around a campfire, this is, this is a great analogy to use as well, isn't it? Because it's dark and you need light. So he says, when you bring in the lamp that brings the light, do you hide it? No, of course you don't, he says. You put it up high so it brings light over a wider distance. Whatever is hidden, says Jesus, it's meant to be disclosed. Whatever is concealed is meant to be brought out in the open. What does this mean? What he's saying is, I've just explained to you the parable of the sower. You now understand it. I don't want you to keep it to yourself. I want you to tell people about it. I want you to understand it. I want to keep 
want you to keep reminding yourself of it and thinking about it and how it relates to real life and your faith. And then I want you to live your faith out loud. I want you to live it out in public. I want you to explain what that parable means to people that you meet who've got any interest at all. And of course, there is that genius little song that you sometimes hear, this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. And it's such a tiny little phrase, but it means so much. It means God has put a light of faith inside of me. He's lit up my life inside, yeah? And I can feel it and I can feel that love and I can feel my faith growing. There's a light, it's, you know, Jesus says, I'm the light of the world. So I'm gonna let that light grow like a seed, mixing with metaphors, but I'm gonna let it grow and I'm gonna let it shine. I'm not gonna hide it, yeah? I'm not gonna let anybody, let's keep it from anybody because I want to share it. I wanna set the world on fire. I want my little light to light all the other lights. Surely that's what you want, says Jesus. Don't, if you've got this gift of faith, don't keep it to yourself and don't suppress it. Don't put it in the darkness. Yeah, you sing it on the way to work, dealing. Why not? Absolutely. You go for it, sister. Sing it loud, sing it proud. <laughs> um, yeah, just keep talking about it, thinking about it, understanding it, let it shine. Keep giving more and more to God the blessings in your trials and tribulations. Give them to God as well. Live your faith more and more and more. Apply it to every aspect of your life, even the really mundane bits, yeah? And it will make more and more sense, you will grow stronger and people will notice your faith as well. Jesus said, consider carefully what you hear. I've just told you this parable, says Jesus. Think about it, keep thinking about it carefully so that you understand it and continue to understand it and don't forget it. And if you've done that, then God will increase your understanding. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you and even more, okay? So you, it, it doesn't matter if you're not the brainiest person in the world or you don't fully understand it, keep trying to understand it and God through the Holy Spirit inside of you will give you that appreciation of it, okay? And I've seen this in so many people that I've known, amazing, wonderful, lovely Christians who they've read the word, they've understood the word, they've struggled with it sometimes, but they've applied it to their life and it has made them, whoa, strong, lovely, gorgeous, passionate people, full of light, full of life, who seem to be able to keep a good spirit, a good positive aspect, even when everything is falling apart in their lives. People who Satan cannot touch because they've that, let their little light shine and be seen by others. Nothing is meant to be kept secret, says Jesus. I know it seems like I'm telling you these secret parables, and he did say earlier, the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but I don't want it to stay secret, says Jesus. I've got to be careful because there are people out there who hate me and are trying to find reasons to be offended by me, but I want you lot to understand it and I want you lot to tell everybody about it as well, so that it's not just coming from me, it's coming from you. I'm sending you out. That's why I've chosen you, you 12 disciples. You've got to carry this same word. And they did, as you know, because um, you can read it later on. So Jesus, so Jesus in verse 25, he says that verse. And again, sometimes we struggle with this one. Whoever has will be given more. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. What that means, it's about faith. OK, so if you feed your faith and you grow your faith and you let your little light shine, you'll be given more. You'll be given more faith. Your faith will take more root. It'll be stronger. Your light will burn brighter intensely. Yeah. But if you don't, if you keep it hidden, if you say things like, oh, how many times have I heard this? Oh, my faith is a very personal thing. I don't talk about it. <laughs> then it's going to die. All right. <laughs> it's going to die. It's not personal, all right? It changes your life from the inside out, but you're not meant to keep it just for yourself. You're meant to share it and you're meant to live by it so that even if people that you meet don't become Christians, they will still be blessed by you, okay? That's what it's all about, right? Let's move on to verse 26, The par another parable. Now, the parable of the sower is in each of the three synoptic gospels, Ma Matthew, Mark, and Luke. This parable of the growing seed only features in Mark's gospel, okay? So Mark has got something here that the others haven't. 
And that makes it kind of interesting. It's another parable of what the kingdom of God is like, says Jesus. It's another one about seed. This is cool. I like this every bit as much as the parable of the sower. So imagine that the man scatter seed, that's you. And you take a seed and you put it in a pot with some compost. And you feed it, you water it, you put it in a, on a windowsill so it gets a bit of sunshine. Maybe you're growing it outside, maybe it's in a greenhouse, all right? maybe it's in a propagator. But you do all of these things, you kind of know that you need water and you need sunlight, the seed, it needs good soil. You do these things and something grows. And you're not terribly surprised when something does grow. But think about it for a second. It's a miracle. Growing something from what appears to be a dead see dead but if you put do the right things with it a miracle occurs and a new life begins there is far more to this metaphor if you read through paul's letters than what we are looking at right here but it's a miracle and i can, can compare it with childbirth i mean most of us know what we need to do in order to make a baby all right but it's still a miracle and most parents realize that this is a miracle. How can we have possibly have produced this baby? It's a miracle. God has done it. God creates every new life. Sure, you play a part in it. You understand the biology behind it, but it doesn't mean that you can work the miracle. If you put a dead seed in a pot and do all the right things that you've learned that you need to do, it will grow. But how has that happened? You have not... Night and day, says Jesus, whether the man sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know why. It's a miracle. All by itself, the soil produces grain and it grows the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel. And then don't, don't be put off by verse 29, which says, as soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it because the harvest has come. The seed, again, is talking about our faith and it starts real small and it feels like, this is never going to go anywhere. But if you nurture it and you try and put down roots and you let your little light shine, you will grow. Your faith will grow and you will become something beautiful, something, a person that you knew you were a person before. And you still have your same character, your same personality, your same gifts, your same appearance. But you have become so much more because you have put your faith in God and you've allowed your seed of faith to grow by the work of the Holy Spirit within you. And that's what the seed of faith ultimately is, isn't it? It's the Holy Spirit living inside of you. And you can just invite it in by saying yes, all right? And when you grow up, if you are grain, you grow and you have this ear of grain, then the harvest comes and what you produce for God is used. Doesn't mean that you get cut down, all right? It means that you grow some more. OK, and what you have grown is used not just for your benefit, but for the benefit of those around you. And ultimately, that brings joy to God. And one of our purposes in life is to bring joy to God. Do good things. Worship him. Pray to him. Share every aspect of your life to him. And that makes him really happy. Trust me, it's all over the Bible. I know this to be true. Here comes another parable, the parable of the mustard seed. Oh, I love this one even more. This one's awesome. What shall we say the kingdom of God is like, says Jesus. So he's comparing it. He's using metaphor. Yeah, it's like a seed. We've been talking about seeds. Let's have one more seed. It's like a mustard seed. He says it's the smallest of all seeds on earth. That's not true, is it? We know that there are smaller seeds than a mustard seed. Matthew puts it better. It, he says it's the smallest of the seeds you have. OK, and in, in those times, 2000 years ago, it was pretty much the smallest seed that was cultivated. OK, that's the key. So it's a really insignificant seed, a mustard seed in terms of agriculture, horticulture, whatever you might say. But, says Jesus, you plant this tiny seed and it's that miracle again. It grows into something massive. A fully grown mustard seed, uh, mustard tree could be 10 feet high. Yeah. How's that happened? says Jesus. You don't get it, do you? You know how to make it happen. You plant it, you feed it, you water it, but God works the miracle. Your seed of faith, if it's planted inside of you, if you've heard the word and gone, yep, yeah, I'm going to go with this. I'm going to believe this and I'm going to sort of try and increase my faith, allow the Holy Spirit to do it. You start small, but you grow into a person who is so strong, who is so massively 
strong and planted that you're like a fully grown mustard tree or any tree you like. I'm going to go for an oak tree. I know it's got like a massive seed, but it doesn't matter. It grows into a huge, strong tree. And the point of you being a huge, strong tree, Jesus says, is so that birds can perch in your shade. If you are a mature Christian, living as best you can with the faith that you've got, others will come to you and take shelter in your branches. You can help other people. People will look to you and they will feel helped by you. They will grow to love you and respect you and hang out with you in your tree because of who you are. Not because of who you are, because of who God has made you. And you have to allow him to do it and say, OK, God, let me grow and then send those people to me. I will give them shelter as best I can. I will try and care for people. The people that you send to me, I will fellowship with them. I will share my life with them. We'll have a lot of laughs together. We'll sit by campfires together, discussing the meaning of life. We'll drink beers together. We'll drink cups of tea. We'll eat cake together, whatever it takes. Yeah, we'll have takeaways together. We'll have a laugh. We will experience life in all its fullness and we will be strong we will not be weak we will not be blown around by every fad and fancy we won't put all of our trust in money yeah we've seen in 2020 haven't we the effect that the coronavirus pandemic has had on our finances as a nation and as individuals as well it's cut us all down it's reminded us just how fragile we are let your faith grow says jesus you will become strong so that you can be strong in yourself but you can help others that is how society is meant to work and it's all there in Jesus's parable does he really need to explain it to us when we see those words we start thinking about it and we think wow this is so deep we could write books on this people have been thinking about Jesus's parables every single one of them ever since he first said them and he only said them once People remembered them because they were interesting and they were about everyday things. And when Mark got round to writing his gospel, he could still remember that parable in all of its detail, wrote it down, as did the others. And they don't conflict in different gospels. So there's that finishing bit with many similar parables. There were lots of them. We're going to hear some more in the course of our study week to week. Jesus spoke the word to them as much as they could understand. There was far more that he could have said, but it was beyond them. And would have been beyond us as well, I'm sure. He didn't say anything to them without using a parable. But when he was alone round the campfire with his mates, he explained everything. And he said, remember it and then tell everybody else. Yeah, remember it, understand it, think about it and it will make a great light. The light of the Holy Spirit will shine in you and out of you you will become that tree to give light to others right final section and kind of this one doesn't really belong with the rest of the chapter it's from verse 35 onwards Jesus calming the storm let's see what happens I'm reading from verse 35 that day when evening came he said to his disciples let us go over to the other side leaving the crowd behind they took him along just as he was in the boat there were also other boats with him a furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, reboked, re re reboked, rebuked the wind and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and waves obey him. Right now, I said earlier, you know, that bit about the light under the bowl, I said, I think he's still just talking to his disciples around the campfire scenario. But I think that parable of the growing seed and then the mustard seed that followed, I think we're back with the crowd at that point from verse 26 where it says Jesus also said so this is on another occasion another day of preaching those are two parables that he would have wanted the crowd to hear not just the disciples remember he would have explained it later to the disciples and the day on the day that he said those two 
growing seed, mustard seed parables. When that day came to an end, the evening came, the crowd went back home again, having heard all that stuff, going away thinking about it. Thinking, what does it mean? How do I apply it to my life? I'm going to remember this. Um, Jesus says, right, <clears throat> let's go to the other side of the lake. It was a big lake, big sea of Galilee. All right. It's a small sea. It's a large lake. And there are many boats on it. And you would have thought, you know, the disciples, I'm sure, would have thought, right, at the end of another day, we're going to go back to Peter's house in Capernaum and chill out. Yeah. Or maybe we're just going to pitch tents somewhere and chill out by the fire. No, says Jesus. We're going to get in the boat. We're going to have like a night sail. We're going to sail across. So imagine, try and imagine what the boat is like. It's bigger than a rainbow, obviously. It's big enough to have a sail. It's big enough to, got, to have the 12 disciples plus Jesus on it. So it's a fairly substantial boat. But I, it won't have any cabins, I don't think, down down below. I don't know. Uh, well, well, Jesus is in the stern of this boat, so he's got room to stretch out. And he's asleep and he's got a cushion. All right. So imagine a boat big enough to have a sail, big enough to have 13 people on board and big enough for Jesus to go to sleep. Off they go, leaving the crowd behind in verse 36. But notice, and this is really interesting, it's a really interesting detail that Mark includes. It wasn't just this one boat that made the crossing across to the other side of the Sea of Galilee that night. There were other boats too. Jesus has got a wider group of friends, hasn't he, than just the 12, and they get in their boats as well, and off they go. And they all follow, because they are the people who wherever Jesus goes, they go. 12 of them have been specifically chosen for specific purposes, but there are others as well. And let's just make sure we understand this for any people who accuse us Christians of misogyny. They aren't all men. OK, understand they are not all men. They are both genders. OK, and they're all following and they're going with Jesus. Now, the Sea of Galilee, as I say, it, it, it's a small sea, it's a big lake, and it, it's got mountains around it. And, uh, you know, things happen with the atmospheric pressure, and it's very easy for uh, storms to blow up very quickly on this lake, okay? It's a bit like going to Lake Windermere and hoping there won't be fog. <laughs> there often is, you know, it happens. Uh, so a furious squall came up, and this, this is a significant storm, all right, because some of the people who are in the boat, uh, presumably the boat belongs to one of them, some of them are fishermen and they're used to going out at night in small boat in that very boat to fish and they are afraid it's like they wouldn't have gone out or if they seen this squawk and they'd have tried to put back to shore as quickly as possible all right but too late and people used to die people used to drown with these sudden flash storms yeah and jesus is asleep now, some people who maintain that Jesus is asleep because he spent a long day of preaching and possibly healing as well. And he's just at it. I mean, you're listening to me, God bless you, for about an hour this afternoon. But Jesus has been teaching all day. And uh, I mean, that might have quite a tiring effect on you as the listener, but it would certainly have a tiring effect on me as the preacher. All right. An hour is plenty for me. I'm ready to stop. Uh, Jesus is whacked out. But there is another reason why he is sleeping through a storm, and that's because he's not afraid. Seasoned fishermen are afraid of this, this weather. Jesus isn't afraid of weather, not at all. And so, so far in this chapter, we've been hearing all about what Jesus is telling us. But just in case we're starting to think, who's he think he is telling us all this stuff? He's about to prove exactly who he is. So they wake him up. They wake him up and they, it's interesting what they say. Don't you care if we drown? You know, how can you be sleeping whilst this is going on? So, you know, they, what, how come you're not worried and anxious and terrified like what we are? Jesus is calm, as calm as it can be. He gets up and he rebukes the wind. Stop, stop blowing. It's just the way it's quiet. Be still. And boom, they are. Wouldn't it be awesome to have power like that over the weather? If you're going on your holidays, if you're, if you're going for a day out or something like that, and you wanted the weather to be nice, you know, and uh, you could just say to the weather, just make sure, weather, that you're sunny and still tomorrow. In my experience, um, that very seldom happens. <laughs> you just have to take the weather that you are given. And that's why what Jesus does is all the more extraordinary, because he demonstrates that he truly is the son of God, only 
Son of God. Only God himself can tell the weather what to do. Yeah? When he does it, when he calms the storm, and he says, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? You don't understand what I'm telling you in my parables, and you don't understand who I am. I mean, for goodness sake, the way I've, been t I've described to you who I am, you know who I am, you know I'm the Messiah, I call myself the Son of Man, I'm a little bit about it, but you know who I am, yeah? So it should be no surprise to you that I can do this. And they're terrified. You can imagine, you know, suddenly the storm has gone, the wind has stopped, everything has gone really silent. And all 12 of them have also gone really silent. That really awkward moment when everybody doesn't know what to say. You know, it happens in all sorts of scenarios. They just go really quiet, but they're really scared because they think, who is he? I mean, we know who he is, but is he really who he says he is? How can he do this? Even the weather does what he says. Wow. Proof, if proof were needed, of all the teachings of Jesus being true, being correct. And remember, this event was witnessed not just by 12 frightened men in a boat who might have cobbled together a story later on to big up their teacher. This was witnessed by all those other boats who were out on the lake that night, who were in the storm and then just saw it stop. Saw the power of God in action. Thank you for listening. This has been chapter four of Mark's Gospel. Thank you for sticking with it. Hope it's been helpful.